G'day, it's Bill here from Side Aerial Trading. I'm in the factory today because we've just had a shipment of two metre scope domes delivered and I wanted to show them off. The two metre scope dome is the baby of the family and it's a bit different to the others in the fact that it's delivered to you as a single finished unit. There's no assembly required apart from bolting on a side bay. Now, it's a fairly small dome, so it's really meant for remote astrophotography, even if it's just set up in your own backyard. It's probably too small for you to be in there looking through the scope yourself, unless you're using a Schmidt cache grain or something really short. Um, there are a couple of things that are the same. It still comes on a pallet, as you can see. It still comes in its weatherproof wrapper, and uh, it, that means you have to unwrap it like a gigantic Christmas present. So let's have a look. Like its big sisters, the two metre scope dome is delivered on a pallet, all nice and secure. The pallet, as you can see, is two metres wide by 2.1 metres long, so it's very close to being square, which is what you'd expect for a dome. Um, the one thing you do have to worry about though is the height. It's two and a half metres high, which means you can run it into things if you're not careful. Uh, it only just fit into the shipping container we received from Poland. Uh, because it's a complete dome, there's no big box of additional motors, cables, panels, and all that stuff you have to assemble. That does mean that the unit itself weighs a chunk, though. It's about 250 kilos. Um, for transport, we obviously prefer a truck, but you can put it on a trailer that can handle the two-metre pallet. Lifting it on and off the trailer is going to be a bit tricky, though. You can lift it with a forklift and move it around with a pallet jack, depending on the surface. We've got nice concrete here. If your location is really tight, you might need a crane. Um, but in a pinch, you can manhandle it if you're very careful, because remember, it's heavy. So let's have a look at what's inside that wrapper. OK, here it is. You can see that it's a complete dome, and it stands on what they call a tower. That's the, the walls part there. The version that we import is the shorter of the two. It's rather confusingly called H80, because that's the height of the door, 80 millimeters, uh, 80 centimeters. Um, the walls are, in fact, about 930 millimetres tall. Um, the dome itself starts a little higher than that, and the shutter, as you can see, is a little higher. Again, uh, it comes down to about 1,350 millimetres above the floor level. Um, let's just pop it open and see inside. Now, because it's fully built, it comes with a mains cable and a plug, although there's a, an extension cord for this one. You'll most likely have power and a network cable coming through the floor. Um, so I'm just going to go and plug it in. Here we are inside the dome. It's still on its pallet. You'd either have it on a deck or a pad, uh, and there's going to be a pier in the middle about there, and uh, your mount and your scope are going to be on top of that. Now, the geometric centre of the dome is 417 millimetres above the top of the walls. Um, that's a little bit below where the shutter stops, which is around about there. Um, now, this height is going to be is, is where you want the intersection of the RA and the deck axes of your equatorial mount. So that's going to determine how high your pier is going to be. Now, also, depending on the design of your mount, the pier is going to be either a little bit north or south of the middle of the dome. So if you're going to use a double fork mounted Schmidt Cassegrain on a wedge, you're probably going to want a larger offset for the pier to get the scope into that optimal place in the centre of the dome. The dome itself parks with the shutter to the south normally, unless you've got a specific reason not to, like there's a heavy prevailing wind or something. Of course, you can set a park position for the dome that's anywhere you like, because the scope dome has power to the ring in every direction. That is, you don't need to park it in a particular place to charge any batteries. Now, inside the dome, you'll see all the necessary things. There's a control box here. There's this guy. Uh, it's on the wall where it won't move. This is where your computer is going, to be go uh, is going to connect. There's a USB plug underneath there somewhere with all these, uh, all these other plugs. Uh, the shutter control box, that's that guy. Uh, it's on the actual dome, so this one does move when the dome rotates. Um, there's wireless communication between the two of them, so that means you can run it around and around and around and never get any wires tangled. Um, the azimuth motor is this guy. It's fairly large and a little bit intrusive, 
but you're probably not going to be spending a lot of time in the dome yourself. Uh, the shutter motor, I don't know if you can see it in the camera, the shutter motor is up there on the roof, um, as well as there's a limit switch up there and a limit switch down there, and there's also a, thermo a thermometer, you might be able to see it there. Uh, there's also a bay down there uh, that you can use for a computer or other equipment. Um, that's just a hole at the moment, but, but it's, it's a large box that you get to with it. Um, now, I've plugged in the dome already. Uh, so like I said, you'd normally have power coming through the floor, um, either on the, your deck or your pad, and it goes into the dome control box. Um, as you can see, we've just got a, uh, an extension cord here. Um, it rotates from a button here on the dome control box like this. So the dome moves, but I didn't. Um, it's really, really quiet. And also, try to stand up inside a rotating dome. It's, it makes you dizzy. Next, I'm going to move it back. lights better. Um, next, if you want to use buttons to open the shutter, you go to the shutter box. Uh, of course, normally you wouldn't do that. You'd have your computer attached and you, uh, you'd use that. But uh, let's see, it's a bit noisier. So with the shutter open, you've got a 590mm aperture there, so that's pretty wide. Um, now if you're, uh, if you're using dome control uh, software like Voyager, you can specify your pier offsets north-south as well as the dimensions of your mount, and it organises the aperture to be in front of Uniscope's optical axis. Um, I think that's all we need to do in here, so let's get out again. Okay, here we're back in the shop. Um, what we wanted to do next was see the sort of telescope you might expect to get into a small dome like this. Um, first, the shutter width is 59 centimetres, so obviously this is the largest aperture you're going to get into the dome. Um, given information on offsets and other geometry, the software you're using to run the dome will be able to place the centre line of the shutter directly in front of your scope, so you can get some seriously large aperture machines in here. Something like a 14-inch SCT would be no trouble at all. Um, next, length. The usable space inside the dome is less than two metres, of course, because that's the outside diameter. Structural parts inside make the usable inside diameter a bit less, and the rotation motor, as you saw, is quite large and can get in the way. Officially, the largest sphere you can get in here, I'll just move to there, is 1.6 metres in diameter, but your scope probably won't be balanced in the middle, so you won't be able to use all of that. To get some examples, we grabbed a mount and set up a few scopes that we had. Move it over here again. We started off with this solid tube newt. Um, it's an 8 inch aperture but a fast f4, so it's only 75 centimetres in length. It fit easily and slews all over the sky with no problems. So next we move to a 10 inch truss. Again, this was an f4, meaning it's a compact 97 centimetres in length. This one fit nicely as well. We did have a 12 inch f4 to try as well, but the flange on the front is fairly wide and it had probably come too close to the rotation motors. Uh, in some targets. You'll also notice that the mount is a bit light for that scope. Uh, by the way, these Astroworks newts we have, we, we can test them because we make them in the factory right here. Um, next we tried a refractor. This is a 100mm Skywatcher Esprit sitting on an iOptron CEM40. Um, at 75 centimetres or so, this one also fit really easily. I think you could go with a much longer refractor, maybe up to 150mm as long as it's a fast uh, f-ratio. Now here we started to have trouble. Um, the Saxon Skywatcher 10 inch F5 got very close to the rotation motor. In fact, it does actually hit in some of our tests. Uh, with some weights, which would allow you to move the scope back a little bit, it'd probably be okay, but you'd have to set it up very carefully, including limits on the mount and stuff. Um, back to the easy stuff. This RC8 was, of course, absolutely no trouble at all. Um, I think you'd be able to get even the larger Schmidt Cassegrains in here, depending on the mount and most RCs. So there you go. 
I really like the two metre scope dome. It's quiet and it's smooth, and because it's delivered in a single piece, it's solid, not flexible, meaning the dome and the shutter don't have to hop over joins or other uneven bits. And that's going to make it really reliable, which is what you want if you're setting up for remote observing. Um, because it gets its power from the ring, you don't need to worry about charging a battery up on the roof, which again makes it just more reliable. You can put a good number of scopes in it. You're really constrained by length, not aperture. Um, you could probably get a 17 inch CDK in there. We've got one here, but we haven't tried it. Um, I think that's probably all you need to know about the two meter scope tone. Um, if you like this video, have a look at our other ones. They're on the Sidereal Trading YouTube channel. Like, rate, comment, you know what to do. I'm Bill from Sidereal Trading, and I'll see you next time. Huh. <sighs>